Okay, so now we're going to do a question and answer portion. And when you guys registered for this conference, we asked you to submit some questions that you might have about being a mom. And I have a panel of ladies that's going to come up right now that I'd like to introduce you to. This is, um, yeah, come on up. This is Trish and also Hannah and Darice and Melanie and Sue. Come on up, ladies. Come sit down. And they all attend the Virtue Bible Study. Many of them are our teachers right here. And um, they all taught on different aspects today of being a mom. So we have some questions that were written in, ladies. We gave them like a sneak peek, so <laughs> they might have a little idea, but I might surprise them. Okay, um, we'll see. <laughs> Trish, <laughs> I'm going to start with you. Okay. This one says, um, my daughter's fallen away from the Lord, and she wants no contact with our family. Do I continue to send gifts and cards on our holidays and birthdays and keep investing in our relationship, or do I try and let her have her own space? I'm sorry for the sorrow that that uh, change, having a prodigal, brings. First of all, I just want to say that personally. Um, when you have a child, in this case a daughter, that doesn't want anything to do with the Lord, and if you and your family represent things that she's kicking against, you have to realize she's really fighting against the Lord. And things change when you have a prodigal. And it's hard and it's heartbreaking, um, but there's also unchangeable aspects to this. Who God is, the comfort we find in his word and his promises and his truth and, and our hope and you as her mom, um, that'll never change. So the answer to that question with compassion is yes, I would continue to demonstrate that agape love. Um, but I also want to add just a little PS. Every one of us that has had a prodigal that I talk with, moms, um, we all have to seek the Lord very passionately and individually for how to reach our kids because God knows what it takes. And the prodigal father let the son go, and there was that absence. And um, so you really, you have to listen to how the Lord knows best to get her back. But your love never cut that off. And if it's demonstrated in cards and holidays, holidays are still going to happen. We don't want to compromise. We never will. But you never want to withhold love. So, Thank you, Trish. No, it's hard sometimes, but just trusting the Lord. Thank you. Okay, hey, Hannah, I have one for you. Talking about a prodigal, how do you bring up a strong-willed little girl? I want to help her embrace her individuality, but we bump heads a lot. So please help. Okay. Um, I have a little, I have a little um, example. So Maddie, are you back there? I think she is, if she can walk. Hannah's very visual. Oh. I love it. I am visual, and it helps me to remember things. So, Okay, so wait, we can't see these yet. Okay, so here's our strong-willed kid, right? And everybody's going, oh, they're so strong-willed, and they're like totally disappointing you and doing crazy things in stores and embarrassing you and stuff, right? Because <laughs> they just have their own little will. But, um, but I think the best thing to do is, if you can in your mind, just 360 this idea of this label on your child. Because strong-willed is one thing, but I think underneath, when you get to know the strong-willed person, there's some really neat qualities in them. And these qualities are things that make great leaders, um, that can stand up for what's right, you know, in just a crazy world. So trying to take this idea, and so I, I used Maddie here. She's so sweet. So here's our strong-willed, labeled, and all good to go, right? That's it. They're strong-willed. What do we do with them? So we take it off, and we just kind of unravel that label that's on them. Sorry, Maddie. She ditches the label. And you know what? Underneath it is some really neat qualities. So <laughs> there's a determined person in there. There's, first of all, they need a lot of love, the strong-willed person. So don't forget the, like Trish was saying, love, 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 love. Um, they're tenacious. They're opinionated. And that can be a good thing if your opinions are for the Lord, right? Um, they're unwavering, also another like super excellent quality when you're walking with the Lord. Um, we're going to fill some in here. I didn't bring my pen, I forgot. But 
No, it's okay. Anyway, you can throw it out there for your strong-willed kid. Maybe they're creative, you know? You can get creativity involved in some of these areas and just creates another side of a dynamic personality. Unyielding, this is good. This can be a good thing. Um, resolute and unbending. So those are all things that I think when they're woven together with the right qualities and with a walk with the Lord, this is amazing. This is an amazing person. So yeah, 360 or mine, if that helped. Thank you. Oh, it's Why don't you give it to Melanie? Thank you, Hannah. So definitely, each child is unique, and we just need to take their individual qualities and really nurture those, and then, right? Okay. Melanie, talking about kids, let's move to husbands for a minute. I'm sorry, repeat the question? Oh, we're just going to talk about husbands. So do you have a special idea as to how to show your husband he's your priority, even on days when it seems impossible? Mm, okay. Well, we're all moms, right? Because that's why we're gathered together. And so we all have crazy busy schedules. So that's a given. But in order to have a successful, thriving marriage, we really do need to make our husbands our priority. And God's word actually admonishes wives to love their husbands. And so we're not discounting that, you're, that you have a million things to do, but really we have to purpose to spend time um, thinking about how we are going to make our husbands our priority. And I'll just give you a quick, they all start with the letter T. It's with our time. You know, spending time, whether that means a five-minute cup of coffee, you know, conversation, or whether it be having a date night and going out to dinner for an hour, or whatever that might be, we need to spend time dating our husbands so that we have that relationship with them and making them a priority. And the other thing is, by the way we talk, what is it that we're, you know, um, how are we speaking to our husbands? I know there's so many times where we use a lot of charm with our girlfriends, you know, but how are we communicating with our husbands? Are our words, you know, filled with grace, or are we grumbling? As soon as, they, as soon as they get home. So we need to make sure that our words are building them up and being edifying. And also with our touch. You know, it's amazing what a kiss will do. It'll be, it's amazing what a kind word will do. And we couple those together. I think it'll be very honoring to our husbands. And, um, you know, we our husbands are supposed to be our priority, meaning coming before all things. And our husbands came before our children and everything else in our lives. And when our when our kids are you know out of the house and they're we've launched them and they're on their way, we still want to have a relationship with our husbands. So whatever time and whatever you know what's necessary to do today, it's going to be investment for down the road to make our husbands our priority. Thank you some practical ways to build up our husbands. But, you know, um, there's some single moms out here, too. So, Doris, can you give us um, some advice? Raising a, single, raising a son as a single mom can be hard. What are some ways to give my son a healthy Christian male role model? Do you have ideas? I do. Well, I, I had three daughters, but I have two grandsons that are 18 and 17, and I watch my daughters raise them. And um, I really have been praying for whoever you are that asked this question. And if there's any other single moms out there, you've really been on my heart for the past couple of weeks and I've been praying for you. So um, I was very purposeful in my answer. So I hope you don't mind that I read it because I really want you to hear what my heart was for you. Um, I was reading 2 Timothy 1.5, and your encouragement is that Timothy had a godly mother and grandmother who prayed for him. And so just knowing that you're going to be praying for your son, that is number one. Um, I wouldn't do anything without prayer. Um, your best weapon and treasure that you have, and Trish talked about prayer, is it, that's your best treasure is praying for them. I feel like the Lord knows your heart, and it's his heart also that your son has a mentor or a godly mentor. But you need to do it with prayer. You just don't want to just grab hold of any man that's out there. It needs to be done with prayer. So I have a few little bullet points. If the Lord puts a man or a teen on your heart through church or through someone that you know is a Christian to be a mentor or a friend, don't be afraid to ask. You're just going to have to take that step and ask them if they would do that for you, if they would take them out once a week or spend time with them twice a month or something. 
Um, big brothers, I saw my one grandson, he had a big brother, he was a Christian. Um, there's a lot of Christians that volunteer in that organization. Maybe your son is small, uh, Awana clubs is good for that. There's Christian men that are in Awana. I just wanna caution you, sports are good, but stay involved and don't assume that they'll have a godly role model in sports. Um, my heart was very grieved recently. My 17-year-old, I walked around the whole football stadium and I heard the conversations from the coaches and the men on the sidelines and my heart was so broken because those are the men that are with the boys. And so I just asked my daughter, please don't let him go overnight with these men. But you know, she, she works. But we got back to where we were sitting and the Lord heard my heart. And a couple said he could go with them when they go to Sacramento. So what I want to tell you is, you have the privilege of being a part of watching God's plan unfold for your son. And so it is a privilege and you will see God come through in the end. Thank you, Doris. Okay, Sue, this is a hard one. I'm, I'm gonna listen real closely here because I have this going on at home sometimes. I know a lot of us have little ones out there. How would you handle a child meltdown or a tantrum in a public place? <laughs> I said, you asked the wimpiest person here <laughs> this question. <laughs> They're smart little things, aren't they? Because they know when you're in public what they can get. One of my grandsons, we had a family photo shoot and everybody was dressed up and he was three and he was so naughty. But I, he was smart enough to know that nobody was going to do anything because we needed to get that picture taken <laughs> at the time. But we're all threatening under our breath. Uh, I think there's a few things um, that I would suggest. First, don't take them out at nap time when they're tired, if at all possible. Make sure they have snacks. They're not hungry. Um, again, I would say, too, as much as possible, don't give in to it because they are that smart, even at two and three, and they know how to work you. And um, I have even seen it in the young moms, too, where they just pick up and say, we're going home, and you're going to bed. It, it's so hard at times, and there's times that you can't just up and leave, but to the best of your ability, um, don't let them win as much as that is because They'll do it better next time. Um, and they're just learning. They can't figure out why they don't get their way. It just hasn't quite registered that I, they want everything. So I would say, first off that, second, don't give into it. And again, unless it's something you absolutely can't, you pick them up and you take them in the car and you take them home and let them think about it. That's what I would do. Thank you. OK, so just stay in it. That's good encouragement. I'm on the right track. Um, and, they, and you will, this is a season, ladies, so they grow up, and then we get to other hard questions, like this one for Hannah about purity. Oh, okay, I have notes. How would you talk time. to your kids about purity, <laughs> Hannah, and when, when should that conversation start? Okay, I don't know why I got this question. Let's see. Um, first of all, whoever asked the question, I'd ask you, like, do you have a boy? Do you have a girl? How old are they? Do you have a good relationship with them? I'd want to probe your mind to find out, like, where you're coming from. Um, but the one thing that kept coming back to my heart was, with this one was that, you know, it's a privilege to have a conversation with your child about purity. And I think that anytime you're talking about that with anybody, there has to be a relationship that's established first. So the bottom line here on this one is, uh, for me, is going to be there needs to be a relationship already formed with trust, with um, being able to talk about issues that are you know, sensitive and sometimes uncomfortable depending on a person's personality. Um, but yeah, I think that's where as a mom, it's a good reminder why we always have to keep putting in uh, time and energy into building that relationship. Um, where was Rhonda? Rhonda, your poem about moments was so sweet. Um, it backs it up. It's like, these are these are these tiny little moments that you don't think much of, and then they eventually lead to a conversation about purity because that trust is there and because that child can look into your eyes and trust what you're saying and sharing with them. So for me, this was really about, um, about instilling that relationship um, 
As far as like an actual age, I've read seven and eight is a good time to sit down and talk to your kids. So that gives you seven or eight years to pound away and get a good relationship going. But yeah, that would be. Thank you, Hannah. That's a hard huh? question. Yeah. Um, Who's next? We might have time for one more here, Trish. Trish. How do you rear a young child, a young adult child, who's still living at home biblically, biblically when you know that they're making the wrong life choice? but you want, to, you want to allow them to make their own choices. Right. How much, is, in your opinion, is too much, and when do you step in? You, you clarified that with a good point. You want them to be successful on their own, and it's a great thing to have them make mistakes while you're in their home, while you're, they are in your home. Um, big difference between under 18 and an adult also a big difference between foolishness and inexperience and what do you mean you went and bought that car for $500 a month for 12 years? <laughs> you know, that's, that's inexperience and foolishness, um, but it's not sin unless, well. So there's a big difference between uh, inexperience and sin. Um, we did have kids... Uh, well, our oldest son came back home during a season he was unemployed, and it was such a pleasure to have him back at home. Um, our buzzword was mutual respect, because he's an adult now, and I cherish the time that, that the Lord brought him back, and he, I can truly say he, he respected and he's walking with the Lord, so it wasn't a, a hard thing for him. But it's mutual respect. Now, if there is defiance against God and they are adults, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You don't put them out on the street. You know, you don't enable sin. Trust God with the tough love because you don't want to compromise the integrity of what happens in your home. So you have to kind of define, is it just an experience or is it rebellion with willful sin as an adult? And, and address it, and um, communication is awesome, always in every situation. So, But it can be a really good thing, and he's back out again, so it's we're empty nesters again. <laughs> and he's getting married, right? Our youngest is oh, okay. getting married. Yeah, congratulations. Okay, one more, one more. Sue, if you had one piece of advice, this is how we're ending it, okay? <laughs> if you had one piece of advice that you could give to a young wife and a mother, what would that be? Oh, I think it would be don't be weary in well-doing. In due season, you'll reap if you faint not. And um, really, don't give up. You're never going to be more tired than you are now. <laughs> you you are those moments as Rhonda said you, you live each one I always remember as I had four um, very close together but I always remember praying Lord I want to enjoy this I don't want this to go away and me just want to wish it away they're older and I did I really did as hard as it was at times as tiring as it was at times and also number two, sorry, would be the enemy comes in with the regrets. How did I miss that? Where was I in that? How come my kid is rebelling when I poured everything into them? But you know, his mercies are new, and he loves that child, your child, more than you do. And dedicate that child to the Lord. Ask for wisdom every single day, and enjoy the journey. Thank you. So just being in the moment. Thank you, ladies.